Oh, you're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. I thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I want you to know that we have had an exciting last couple of days. And uh, I'm thankful for all of those that helped yesterday as we hosted our Central Coastal Bend Vision 7 uh, training session here. And that was for those that are uh, in leadership of the Vision 7 uh, services. And Brother Watt is excited about Pentecost Sunday because that's going to be his Sunday. Amen. But we are going to have Easter Sunday. Amen. We're going to have a baby day, baby dedication, April the 3rd. Amen. We're going to have a family day on April the 10th. Praise God. We're going to have... Uh, professional day I believe on April 17th hope I'm getting these right and uh, we're gonna have a uh, educators day help me out sister Brandy I get all come you know convoluted I'd like that word there she goes March 27th Easter Sunday April 3rd we're gonna have baby dedications we're also gonna have funds and games for our kids that Sunday uh, so Children's Day Family Day April 10th and we're gonna have something planned for Family Day amen you know I we, I was over that uh, class yesterday and different things were brought up and and uh, who knows we might have to have a barbecue cook-off I, I just think my fajitas are better than anybody else's in here you, you'll, you'll be a judge You'd be, Brother Haggard, you'd be a judge. You don't mind. Brother Waddy said he'd be a judge. Oh, you say yours is good. No, no. Brother Blackburn, my bishop, one of my bishops from Springs of Life in Deer Park. What Brother Waddy is, is he's helping me get that all organized and coordinated and helping oversee that service. Mother's Day, May the 8th. Everybody ought to come to church for Mama. April 24th, Professional Day. April 17th, Education Day. We're going to honor our families, our educators, those that are professionals, whether it's the mayor of the city or a police officer, first responder. Amen. Friends Day. Everybody should have a friend. And uh, so Mother's Day, Pentecost Sunday. Amen. We throw our roots back to Pentecost. You can be seated this morning. I don't want you to tire from standing. I'll be standing for the next hour or so, but y'all y'all can sit down. But I'm thankful today to be in the house of the Lord and to be able to come and worship. I, we had a tremendous prayer meeting this morning. And our, 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 uh, our leadership training class, and that's just for anybody that's wanting to grow. That's not for, you say, well, I'm not a leader. Well, do you want to be a leader? You want to be a leader? That's a good class to come to at 8.30. Amen. And it flies by. And it flies by. So 9 o'clock we start praying. Our children, a lot of our, our teachers are coming at 9 o'clock to 9.15. And uh, we get in here and we pray. And this morning, I want you to know we had church before we had church. We got to praying and people got to shouting and dancing and having a good time. Praise God. And there was no music and it wasn't pumped up. It was just the Lord and us. Amen. So thankful for that. Let me go ahead and get the other announcements up there if I can. And uh, that way we can get this uh, stuff out of the way. Uh, May, uh, March the 11th, this Friday night uh, at 6.30 p.m. Is that right? This Friday night? Uh, we're having our children's kids prayer night. And we want to teach our kids how to pray. And so Brother and Sister Webb is going to bring our kids up here. We're going to meet at the sanctuary. And uh, just any of the, if you want to bring your kids, come with them. There's nothing more powerful than a mom or dad praying with our children. And I don't know what's going to happen. Amen. One of those children might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Or a parent that their kid rides the bus and they come might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, amen. That's this coming Friday. March 25th, Friday, March the 25th, we have the men's lunch loaded baked potato with trimmings fundraiser. Now, Brother Patterson has tickets made up. We had tickets made up, making it real easy on you, brethren. Amen. Brother, go ahead, Brother Waddy. Since you got yours, just kind of hold it up. There's 20 tickets in there. Now, Sister Brandy helped in this, so they're numbered. 
And she's got it written down who took what number of tickets. Huh? Eight dollars. You can't get a loaded baked potato with the trimmings for eight dollars. Not very, not like we're going to serve, Brother Myers. Not like we're going to serve. It's going to be sanctified. See, he should have put sanctified loaded baked potatoes. But our men are going to work together for that. You say, well, what's it for? We're, gonna, we're raising our money so we can send every man that wants to go to men's conference to men's conference. Every man that won't have to pay their way, we're going to join together. We're going to pay our own way. Amen? And uh, we're going to get rooms, and, and that'll be for one night for us to stay together. And uh, ladies, we, do, we treat ourselves well. We go eat a good meal. Praise God, Brother Much. Amen. Amen. We had ribs last year. All oh, them ribs were good. We, I'm just not, you had to been there. But uh, we're going to have a good time again this year. But we don't want anyone not being able to go because of finances. Amen. And so we're going to join together. And I appreciate Brother Thomas Patterson putting that together. So men, let's sell those tickets. And uh, let's do our best to... Uh, get our budget raised so we can go to men's conference. Now, on Pentecost Sunday, the men's director for the South Texas District, Brother Blackburn, will be preaching. And uh, it's going to be a 2 o'clock service on May 15th. Everybody say May 15th, 2 p.m. Amen. And uh, we're, we're hoping and believing that we're going to reach out to other uh, oneness Pentecostals in our area and have a joint uh, fellowship meeting. Uh, and so we're just excited about what God is doing. And Brother Silas's church, Brother Bybee, amen, has gone to El Campo. And through the Acts and Anger Management class, he, God's blessed him. And I'm very thankful. And uh, he's got a church going. And it looks as though he's going to uh, uh, be uh, pastoring the church in Edna, Texas. And uh, I'm very thankful that God is doing things. As I, I, I laughed at him, though. He called me this past week. And. And we were talking, and, and uh, he says, Look, Brother Bumgarner, if any of you, if the men in your church want to preach, you, you tell them I'll, I'll preach them. He said, I've gone from preaching once a quarter to half and preach once or twice a week. And I just started laughing. I said, Uh-huh. Now you've got to be prepared all the time. <laughs> you ain't got all that free time on your hand. You've got to get in the book. You've got to study. You ain't got time to just be talking and debating. You've got to have a word. So... Uh, but uh, I, I'm thankful that God can, you know, I'm thankful that God can work in people's lives. Amen. And, you know, that, uh, that we, can, we can walk together. The Bible says, now, we, we always focus on the holiness part. But the first part of that scripture is to walk in peace with all men. And holiness. Now, we, we catch on to the holiness part real quick. But we forget about walking in peace. My, my first objective of that scripture is to be at peace with my brother and my sister. Praise God. Well, amen. That didn't cost you nothing. That was a free one. But praise God. If you have your Bibles this morning, mark the chapter, the eight, mark the eighth chapter. To all of our visitors and guests, we're so thankful that you're here today. Blessed to have you in the house of the Lord. And uh, looking forward to... Uh, Seeing now, now you're going to be seeing uh, flyers about each of those services, Amen. We're I'm really believing on Easter Sunday we're going to break the record of our church. I don't even know what it is, but I want to set a new one. Praise God, Amen. Brother Rodriguez has been averaging. He started out averaging about 20 to 21 folks in the prison. Now he's up to like 40 people, Amen. So. And that's just a Sunday morning outreach for Peace Tabernacle. That's, that's one of our congregations. And I'm thankful for that today. But I'm believing that we're going to pack this house out on Easter Sunday to start it out right. Amen? Praise God. Mark, the 8th chapter, the 11th verse. I come this morning with a burden on my heart from the Lord. And I want to reach somebody today. Tonight, you won't want to miss tonight. Pastor Jimmy Lewis, Spring of Life, is going to be preaching for us. And uh, he always brings a good word. And he always brings a lot of energy with him. I'm sure he's going to bring some of his folks with him. We're going to have a good time. But this morning, 
Mark, the 8th chapter, the 11th verse. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. Has anybody ever been exasperated? Huh? When you're dealing with somebody or dealing with something and you go, <sighs> and you're like, really? <sighs> I'm so tired of this. Hmm? Anybody ever been there? That's how Jesus felt when the Pharisees came to him. The Bible says that he sighed deeply in his spirit. He had one of those exba exasperated moments where he's like, really, we're going to do this again? And he asked the question, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. I'm going to preach this morning from this thought. There is a generation. There is a generation. Lord, I thank you today for being the Lord of every generation. And I pray, mighty God, today that you would open our understanding, anoint these lips of clay, and anoint our ears to hear, open our understanding. Let us draw closer to you today, Lord. We want to feel your power this morning. Fill our minds and our spirits. Lord, I pray somebody receive the gift of the Holy Ghost this morning. Somebody make up in their mind to live for you. In Jesus' name. Can somebody say in Jesus' name? God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. You know, it seems that times never change. Times never change. Sin has always been sin. The wickedness of man always swings from one degree of the pendulum to the next. Either the moral compass of man is such that there is no God, and thus the behavior of man is judged according to his conscience hello you look at the history of man and when men amen begin to think within themselves that they are good that pendulum begins to swing to where man makes up their own moral code can i say that without the church today our world would be in worse shape than it is right now Men will decide what is moral. Men will decide what is right. Men will decide what is just. Uh, you see, the thing is, is that when Jesus stepped into the world, He calls for the pendulum to swing back to the opposite direction. He brought back a balance uh, to everything. Amen. He taught not just the law, but the spirit of the law. He did not just teach a letter of the law, which he believed in upholding, but there was a spirit in the law that was more powerful than the letter of the law. Can I get an amen this morning? But yet through time, that things happen. The church is born. And it's not too long after that that man gets a hold of things and he takes a church and he begins to institutionalize it. He begins to put his man-made thinking or as Brother Wayne Huntley likes to say, he puts his stinking thinking into the mix. And it's not too long that when man gets a hold of the church, uh, that he 
desecrates the apostolic doctrine. He takes the word of God. He begins to twist it to, for his own gain. He begins to manipulate uh, the, the word of God uh, to control other people. That's what happened when you take the truth and you begin to compromise it. And, and when the Catholic Church was born, and again, I've said it many times and I'll say it again, I love Catholic people. They make great Pentecostals. Amen. But I don't believe any man can forgive you of your sins. Only one man can forgive you of your sins, and that is Jesus. For he died for your sins. He is the one who hung upon a tree and shed his blood for your sins. But man began to control the religion because people by nature, amen, have a desire inside of them to seek out a God, to love them. People inside of them want to serve God. People inside of them are always looking for, for God. That's why paganism was so powerful in its time and in its day and even into, to this day and time. Amen. Why do people worship, worship idols? They see them. It gives them something to recognize. And, and, and so they worship them. Amen. Pantheonism, where they worship the trees, they worship the branches, they worship the animals. Why? Because we're searching. We want to have something to believe in. People are looking for something to believe in. The dark ages come upon the church. Where the church was more of a suppressive force. Not the church, but the religious society of the day. Hello? You, you had people that would, amen, be dominated by those, amen, who were supposed to be, amen, godly men. The dark ages had its time. The dark ages saw people suffer in the name of the Lord. Not for the name of the Lord, but in the name of the Lord. But that pendulum, it begins to swing back. It had swung that way and man had taken religion and used it for his own glory. But, but then there's always a seeker. There's always somebody that wants truth. There's always... Somebody says this can't be at all. And so you have Martin Luther, who's doing his best to be a devout, amen, believer. And he's trying to pay his penance. He's trying to do his suffering. Amen. Because that was one thing that they really believed in. You know, if you were going to be a priest or a nun during that time, you had to suffer as Christ suffered. And they still teach that in a lot of places. But... Uh, as he's making himself suffer and he sees that he is bleeding and he is hurting, he gets the revelation. Jesus already paid the price. He already paid it all. He already suffered. I don't have to suffer. And through Martin Luther came the Reformation. And through the Reformation... Amen. Men begin to read the word and study the word and begin to obey the word, not because someone told them what to do, but because they saw it for themselves. Can I tell you something this morning? If you're going to get anything from God, it's got to be that you get it for yourself. You can't live for God because mama's living for God. You can't live for God because grandma's living for God. You can't live for God because, uh, amen, cousin's living for God. You got to live for God because you want to get something from God. Amen. I don't care who your grandma was. Huh? Can I preach to Brother Wally for a minute? Hey, you know what? We had some great grandmamas. Holy Ghost apostolic field women. But you know what? I can't get to heaven on what they had. I can't get to heaven on what mom and daddy has. I can't get to heaven on what my sisters, my brothers have. I got to get to heaven on what God gives me. I'm going to have to seek him for myself. I'm going to have to get into the word for myself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So through time, amen, others begin to get 
at Revelation, they begin to get understanding. The, the Calvins and the John Wesleys and, and, and the Spurgeons, and they, and they begin to lead this movement, this Reformation movement to, to the Great Awakening. And it's during this period of time, during the Great Awakening, that the Apostolic Church uh, begins to see its resurgence in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and the Holy Ghost is poured out uh, in Topeka, Kansas. And, and the revelation of Jesus' name is revealed. And amen, there's brothers, uh, amen, that begin to see the Word of God and revelation is given and truth is given. And it was at the council, amen, with... Brother G.T. Haywood and Brother Urshan and Brother Kilgores and others that were there. Amen. And there was a debate going on about the Trinity versus the oneness of God. And the Assemblies of God voted to hold on to the Trinitarian doctrine. That there's one divine spirit and three persons. That is not true. There's one Lord, one faith. One baptism, one Lord above all, through all, and in you all. And his name is Jesus. One of my favorite parts of that story is, is that those brethren that agreed to stay with the Trinitarian doctrine begin to sing that song, Holy, Holy, Holy. You know, the, the Trinitarian anthem, you know. And Brother G.T. Haywood, as he was leaving the building, he, he began to sing a little chorus. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Hey. And so through time, there's been a swing in the pendulum. And for a season, amen, people walked according to the word of God. During this great awakening that birthed the Pentecostal church, amen. There was a time when you could walk down the street, you couldn't tell a Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled person from a Baptist person. You couldn't tell a Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled person from a Methodist person. Because there was a time when modesty meant something to everybody. There was a time when women didn't wear that which was pertained to a man and a man didn't wear that which pertained to a woman. And in times past we've had to preach strongly about Women not, women not wearing that which pertained to a man, but now I've got to preach. Men, don't put on no skirt. Hey Amen. I saw an advertisement the other day for combat kilts. I'm sorry, you'll never see your pastor in a combat kilt. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. Now they have man bags. It's not a man bag, it's a purse. We live in a day and age where we want to set our own morals and say this is right and that's right and this is acceptable. And, and, and the Lord didn't really mean that when he said that. No, I'm going to tell you something. If the Lord said it, he meant it. Amen. Amen. You know what? Too many times... We give credit to too many wrong people. We say Jonah wrote that book, or we say Paul wrote that book, or we say, uh, you know what, scribes wrote the book, but God gave the word. Oh, some of y'all didn't even understand that. I said God wrote this. This is his holy word. He wrote the book. The scribes wrote it down. And so, in our day and age, amen, there's a pendulum, right, wrong. And can I say today that if you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, that there's an altar for you today. You can come today and you can ask Jesus to forgive you today of your sins. More so than any man, Jesus can forgive you of your sins. There's a baptismal tank ready today uh, to baptize you in Jesus' name, to have his name applied to your life, uh, to have his blood wash your sins away. Because what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The pendulum had stayed true for many years, but as 
the spiritual aptitude of the church. When I say church, I'm talking about organized religion and those, amen, that profess Christianity. It becomes institutionalized. It becomes modernized. And I'm not against modernization, but I am against, amen, modernizing to the point that you take all the God out of it. Because there's a shifting back to that which was a weakened people to look at themselves instead of the Lord. To, to begin to look at ourselves and say it's all on us. I was talking to the leadership class this morning and I told them that, uh, you know, worship is a very important thing and prayer is the most important of all. I believe in prayer. I believe touching God through prayer is the greatest thing that a church can do. There is nothing more powerful than prayer. I will always believe that. I will always preach that. I will always teach that. There is nothing more powerful than prayer. Apostolic churches cannot operate without powerful prayer. Because if we don't pray... I might as well turn the lights out, put the spotlights on, bring the smoke machines in. Hook up my bass, get somebody to give us a beat. Amen. Begin to jump up and down and just make a party out of it and get as many people as I can in here. I heard a very devastating story this week. It was quite sad. And I'm not making fun, but I am. There was a church in Nashville, Tennessee. One of their smoke machines went out. And they were singing a song, but without the smoke, they couldn't see the Shekinah glory of God. And it just killed the spirit for the worshipers. Now, I don't know what that makes you think, but that just... As they say on Facebook, SMH, shake my head. I mean, do we have to have a physical sign? See, we, people, the, this generation, I want to see it. Give us a sign. If I see the smoke, that makes me think that the Lord is here. I'm going to tell you something. If you pray and seek him, you'll know he's here, and you won't need no smoke and mirrors to know he's here. You won't need no neon lights flashing from the platform to say, I'm here. If he comes in here, there's a holy hush that takes place. If he steps in here, amen, you'll hear some moaning and some crying and, the, and some weeping. This morning we were just in prayer meeting and all of a sudden you hear some moaning and some crying and some wailing and some rejoicing and some shouting and some tongue talk. What happened? He showed up. And so the church begins to weaken itself because we want to substitute what it takes to get his presence. See, that's the problem. We're lazy. Not y'all. No, 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 no. I'm lazy. Here, let me just preach at me. Let me not, let me not just preach at y'all. I'm lazy. Sometimes I don't want to get up and pray. Sometimes I don't want to get up and read my Bible. Amen. Sometimes I don't want to get up and, 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 you know, especially some of you, you know, y'all come to church and worship the Lord. Sometimes this is work for me. Do you get up every morning wanting to go to work? Welcome to my world. Only problem is, is when you love your job, you can't wait to get up and go. So I love my job. I can't wait to get here. Now, sometimes I'm tired, though. Amen. After this past week and this weekend, amen, I overslept this morning. Sister Bumgarner had to wake me up. Thank you, Lord, for Sister Bumgarner. I forgot to set my alarm clock. I might have done that on purpose. <laughs> but you know, we, we, we're being real. It's, it's not easy 
God doesn't want it to be easy. And you say, well, why is that, Brother Bumgarner? Because he inhabits the praises of his people. He wants you to set aside all that you're involved in. That, that's, that's the problem with a lot of us. We don't want to set aside what we're, what we're doing. We want to set aside what I'm doing. I've been on this thing for three hours. And you want me to put it down to pray? Up, oh, words of friends. Now, I play words of friends now, again. But you know what? You got to be careful that you don't let them, every time something notice pops up and says, hey, 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 oh, I got to get, oh, hey. Sometimes you need to say, not this hour. This hour belongs to Jesus. Amen. Sometimes if you call pastor and he doesn't answer, especially in the morning time, he ain't being rude. He's not asleep. He's having his time with the Lord. Amen. Often with my Bible and a cup of coffee. Praise God. You say, what are you trying to teach us and preach us, Brother Bumgarner? Proverbs 21 and 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Come on now. Every, every man thinks, well, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm okay where I'm at. Everything was good. We talked about it last week. The Lord tries the hearts. And you can say, I don't think it takes all that. Or I, I don't feel you have to live it a certain way. But the Lord wants you to know the thoughts of your heart. He knows the attitude of your heart. And so he's searching there. He's prying and he's probing and, he, and he's checking your spirit. And, he, and he's testing your will. And he's trying to see if you're walking in obedience or if your behavior is motivated out of pure rebellion. And, you know, one elder said it like this. God doesn't care why you do something he, or cares what you do. He cares why you want to do it. And so, you know, we get the attitude, you know, you're not going to tell me what to do, preacher. And you're not going to tell me how to live, preacher. And, and I'm going to do it my own way. That's the problem with a lot of people is that they say, I'm going to do it my own way. Can I tell you, the Lord gave you a pastor, amen, because he loves you. Come on now. Can I give a warning out to somebody today? Hebrews 13 and 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls. And they that must give an account. Now let me just say something here. We live in the year 2016. And it is not a popular thing. Amen. Because we're a bunch of independent Americans. Amen. To let another man. Uh, amen. Have charge over us. It's not fun to be submitted to somebody. Amen. You know, it's, it's like uh, the little boy, you know, he was standing up and his mama told him to sit down. And finally he relented and sat down. And a few minutes later he looked at mama and said, I'm still standing up on the inside. And that's how a lot of folks are, preacher. You know, you can tell me what to do, and I may comply, but on the inside, I'm still rebellious, and that's what God is looking at. God is still looking at your heart. He wants to know, are you really in obedience to me? Because I put a man in your life, a man of God in your life, uh, who's going to give an account for you, so uh, he's going to be able to stand. Now, he can do it with joy. What the Word says, that they may do it in joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. 
It's unprofitable for you uh, if I have to stand before the Lord. Uh, amen. And I have to give an account for you before the Lord. Uh, amen. And I have to stand there with grief uh, and sadness and say, uh, I, I want to be able to give a good report. Uh, I want to be able to rejoice and be full of joy. Uh, I don't want to have to say that they came to church, uh, but they were unchanged. Uh, they didn't worship and they didn't praise you, Lord. And, and they refused to obey your word even though it was preached. They did their own thing and they went their own way stating they knew what they were doing there is a generation that thinks that way and believe me I will have to stand it is with great grief that I will have to give that report I believe that there are some here today that if you don't change your way If you don't stop living the way you're living and you don't commit yourself to living for God, I'm going to have to stand there with a grieving spirit and tell God, it was preached to them. It was given to them. Uh, hey Amen. I, I, I preached till I sweat through my clothes and then and, and, and I gave it everything I had, Lord. Uh, and I told them and Brother Fisher told them and, and Brother Phillips told them and Brother Hill told them and many, many before us told them, Lord, it was told in Wharton, Texas. It was preached in Wharton, Texas. But they refused to obey you are like those written about by the wise that go in Proverbs the 30th chapter or egg or however you want to say it. Proverbs 30 and 11 there is a generation Proverbs 30 and 11 if you can put it up for me sister Brandy there is a generation that curseth their father and does not bless their mother there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Come on now. We're, we're not too bad. We're okay. We're not a bad people. We're pure in our own eyes. And yet is not washed uh, from their filthiness. Uh, amen. There's a, a generation that wants to say everything's okay. Uh, I'm all right. Uh, and yet you're still living in the sinfulness of this world. Uh, you're still contaminated by the flesh. There is a generation. Oh, how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are not are lifted up. Huh? You talking to me, preacher? Again? You know, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm thankful you're here. But I can smell your spirit a mile away. You understand how I said that, brother? What? I smelled their spirit. Because some spirits just stink. What's he talking about? You ever saw somebody got their eyes up in the air? Not humbled. Proud. Arrogant. Will not submit to God. And I'm trying to preach today with compassion because I have compassion for you. Proverbs 30 and 14. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Consuming, always consuming. Always out for me. That's the place we've gotten to in this day and age. Always trying and you want to you mess with somebody, do something for them. There's a lot of weight to that scripture when you prefer your brother. Hey Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I have a very good friend, that, and it just blew my mind. I was telling my wife about it this morning. Bishop Blackburn, he, he retired from his church as pastor. He's becoming a bishop, and, and they've got things worked out. And, and he's had several of us young men that's come up in his church. His son being one of them. Now, I've never believed in spiritual nepotism. I've never believed in it. I believe God has appointed men. And if it's a son, then I'm all for it. If it's a son, and it's God's will, then I'm for it. But I don't necessarily believe it has to be the son always following the father's footsteps. That may not be the will of God. 
And so Brother Blackburn, amen, he had struggled with it, and uh, the Lord spoke, showed him a vision. And, and, and in his family's history, every time somebody in his family's died, Brother Blackburn's received a vision. He saw their funeral. Well, the Lord showed him in prayer one Sunday morning his own funeral. So he knew I better do something. But here's where I respect his son, and his son's a good friend of mine. He went to his son and said, look, you know, you've been faithful. You've stayed with me, you know, and I'm going to be resigning. I'm going to be retiring from pastoring, be working as a bishop, which his other sons in the gospel are thankful for. And my buddy Bill, his son, prayed about it said, Dad, it's not the will of God for me to pastor. Now, in the day and age of entitlement, and it's about me, I don't know what, what you think, but he said there's another son of the gospel that's here, and it's for him. And God worked it out. And another man that Brother Blackburn raised up, Brother Josh Blackburn, who preached here on a Wednesday night, amen, he's now pastoring there. And Brother Blackburn's son, Bill, is the assistant pastor. What do you say, what does that got to do? In a me generation, in a generation where people are about devouring one another, it's just an awesome thing to see a man say, you know what, I'm full of the Holy Ghost enough. Just because my daddy was pastor doesn't mean that that's what I'm supposed to do. You see, when you find your place in the kingdom of God, and find yourself content. That's not where I'm supposed to be. But here's where I'm supposed to be. Here's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm going to be doing it every day for the rest of my life to the glory of God. The horse leech has two daughters crying. Give. Give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not it is enough. The grave. The barren womb. The earth that is not filled with water. And the fire that saith. Not, it is enough. Fire continually consumes. Dry ground cries out for water. The barren womb says, give me a child. And the grave says, one more, one more, one more, one more. It's no wonder that Paul would write in 2 Timothy. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Somebody say, there's a generation. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Doesn't it sound like he's just repeating what the psalmist wrote, to, or in Proverbs, I mean, uh, uh, the Agar wrote in Proverbs, there's a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. Heady, high-minded, just like those that have eyes and eyelids that are lifted up, uh, those that have teeth that are sharp, to devour, to consume. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. There is a generation having a form of godliness. Having a form of godliness. There's lots of folks that say they believe in God. There's lots of folks that make symbols that recognize God. There's lots of folks that say, I believe in God, but they deny the power thereof. It's, you got to do more than just accept him. you got to do more than just say you believe in him. You've got to understand him in the power of his might. you got to understand him, amen, and who he is in his glory. You have to do more than just have a form of godliness. You have to put on the whole armor of God. You have to embody yourself in this. 
Amen. He said that after that the Holy Ghost come upon you, you would be endued with power from on high. Authority from on high. He doesn't want you just to have a little bit of authority. He wants you to have a whole lot of authority. He doesn't want you just to be a little bit Holy Ghost filled. He wants you to be a whole lot Holy Ghost filled. He doesn't want you just to be a part time Christian. He wants you to be an all the time Christian. Amen. He doesn't want you just to, to go through the motions and say you go to church. He wants you to be the church. And so there are factors that are constantly coming against us. Uh, you better be careful. And I talked to someone this morning of which way you're allowing the pendulum of your soul to swing today. Uh, for the word of the Lord uh, uh, gives a warning to us. Uh, amen. We always know uh, the word of God says as a man thinketh in his heart. See, you know it. Yet we need to look at the whole context of the scripture. Because he said in verse 1, when thou saidest to eat with a ruler... Consider diligently what is before thee, Proverbs 23 and 1. And put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Huh? Hey, you say, well, I'm going to be careful. Up here. I, it's sharp, I promise you. He cut butter the other day. What's he talking about? Jesus said it like this. If your eye offend thee. If your hand offend thee. And so. It's better to be saved. Dismembered. Now I'm not telling anybody to go pluck your eye out. Because it's an allegory. And you need to understand that. Job said I made a covenant with my eyes. What are you saying brother Bumgarner? If you're going to be given to appetites. If there's things in this world. Amen. That's going to cost you to just be a glutton for them. Be not desirous of his dainties. For they are deceitful me. You got to be careful of what the world's offering you today. This generation's looking for somebody to offer them something. And they're, they're always giving you something that they can't fulfill, okay? Uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, yet the world continually tells you, oh, it's going to make you feel better. You can drink all you want, but it won't make you feel better. Especially the next day. I liked nothing better when I worked with them old boys. Especially after Super Bowl Sunday. Amen. To be loud on Monday morning. I know. I, that was my flesh, brother. You're talking about your, That was my flesh. But if I knew that they had been up partying all night Sunday night. And they had a hangover. Hey, good morning, Tim. How you doing? Hey, man. He, he's up, bro. He's up. He's up. Man, we had some church last night. Super Bowl church, man. I know it probably affected my witness. But you got to be careful for what the, the world's offering you. They try to tell you it's going to make you feel better. But see, the thing about the world is it's con contained in the things of the world. And what I mean by that is, is that a drug can only last as long as the effect of the drug. The alcohol is only going to last as long as the substance is in your system. But after a while, it's going to leave you. And you're still as empty as when you first consumed. And that's why there's a cycle. I can't wait for the weekend. Why? Because I'm going to get my fix. It's out of my system right now. I really need to go get my fix. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Boy, that'll preach right there. Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle towards heaven. Here today, gone tomorrow. 
Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desires thou his dainty meats, or dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You better be careful whose meat you're eating today. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. That's what Lucifer, when he was tempting Jesus, you know, if you're the son of God, take these stones, make them into bread. Or as Sister Garza used to say when she testified, you know, take these stones and make them into tortillas. <laughs> But Jesus always came back with a word. It is written. It is written. See, the devil, he wants to tempt you with riches. He wants to tempt you with, with uh, uh, things that would seem to have life-giving substance that will keep you. But there's only one thing that's going to keep you. I want to bring a warning to somebody. There's a, you know, you better be careful of of those that you, you hang out with and, and those that uh, doesn't want you living for the Lord. Because they're no better than Lucifer himself. You better be careful from those on the outside trying to influence you not to go to church. Not to live for God. You better be careful of who you allow to influence you. Because I'm going to tell you, they're no better than Lucifer was when he tempted Jesus. Ah, uh, don't tell me that. Say, well, you calling people the devil? Yes, I am. Sometimes people become the devil. I can prove it scripturally. In one minute, Peter's praising God and being called the one given the keys of the kingdom. But then the next minute, Jesus tells him, get thee behind me, Satan. So you can't tell me that people can't put on the devil's shoes. Because the devil, he wears a hypocrite's shoe. And if you don't watch out, he'll slip it on you. They'll make you feel like uh, they, they love you. They'll make you feel like they are for you. Uh, amen. But their heart is not with you. Uh, you better wise up today and realize that they're part of a generation that is turning their backs on the Lord and they want you to go with them because misery loves company. But I want you to know uh, you don't have to follow the misery today. Uh, you can make up in your mind that I'm going to be part of a generation that lives for God. Uh, I'm going to be part of a generation that is in all the way. Uh, I'm tired of seeing people in now and out tomorrow. Uh, I'm tired of seeing things, uh, amen, of people who claim, uh, amen, to be living for God uh, and yet they want to do everything in the world. Uh, either you're a part of the church uh, or you're a part of the world. Uh, it's that easy. There's no gray area is, it's black and white. Either you're in or you're out. Either you're right or you're wrong. Either you're saved or you're unsaved. Proverbs 14 and 14 says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. It always seems that the backslider in their heart says, I'm okay. You don't have to worry about me, but I'm here to tell somebody today, if you're a backslider, you are lost and you are going to hell. If you're a backslider, you need to pray through this morning. If you're a backslider, you need to get a hold of God. Isaiah did it like this. Isaiah cried out. Throughout Hosea, hey amen, he uses the word woe. He cries it out. Basically, he's saying, hold on, hold up, wait a minute, stop. He says, woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. 
Isaiah 5 and 8, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, uh, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Uh, woe unto them, verse 18 of uh, Isaiah 5, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope. Uh, woe unto them, verse 20, that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Verse 21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Verse 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Verse Isaiah 6 and 5, he, uh, he makes a self-declaration. He says, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts he makes a recognition I'm unclean because then I get into his presence I realize how unclean I am and I do too when I get into his glory I realize I'm not worthy to feel his presence amen mistakes I've made I'm not worthy to be in his presence and yet he loves me anyway. Thank God for his goodness. Because the reason I can feel his mercy and grace and his love and his spirit today is not because of my goodness. It's because of his goodness. Isaiah 10 and 1. Warn to them that decree unrighteousness decrees. That right grievousness which they have prescribed. Isaiah 17 and 12. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. And to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. And those woes were not just for the Old Testament, but Jude, he cried it out in Jude 1, 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Whoa, hold on, hold on. Stop. And I'm here today and I'm telling somebody, stop, stop, stop. Stop playing games with God. Stop being one thing at church and another out there in the world. Nobody likes a hypocrite. Nobody wants to be witnessed to by a hypocrite. Revelations 8 and 13, I'm trying to come to a close. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Stop, stop, stop. Heed the warning. Hear the call. Make it right. It's coming. Woe. Revelation 9 and 12, one woe is past, and behold, there cometh two woes more after. And then Revelations 11, 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And you can read those for yourself or come on Wednesday night. And we'll be getting into those down the road. But Revelations 12 says this, and there was war in heaven. There was war in heaven. Now, you got to get an understanding. If you want a picture of what happened in this earth, if you want to have a picture of what happened in eternity and times past, read Revelation's 12th chapter. And there was war in heaven. Was war. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. See, in Genesis, he's an old serpent. By revelation, he's a dragon. Serpent is a symbol of wisdom. But the dragon is a symbol of ultimate wisdom. What are you saying? He got smarter. Called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength 
and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night that's what he does and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb thank God for the blood and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death they rejoice. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has just a short time. He knows he's just got a short time. He knows that he's got kicked out of heaven. He knows that he'll never be able to go back. He knows he lost that war. He knows that he's identified as a serpent and a dragon. He knows that his time is numbered. And he desires nothing more than to take you with him. I'm coming to a close. Will you stand to your feet? There's a generation that will be saved today. And there will be a generation that is consumed by the enemy of our eternal souls. For he knows well. He knows. The joy that you're going to have throughout eternity living with the Lord. Not for the Lord, with the Lord. He knows, Brother Wadi, what it's like to be in his presence every day. He knows what it's like to feel the goodness of his spirit. He knows what it is when all of heaven rejoices. He knows what it's like, uh, amen, uh, for, for the four and twenty elders, amen, to bow down before the Lord. He knows he stood there uh, in his glory, glimmering, shining, uh, amen, as that angel of light, uh, a reflection of the Spirit of God himself. He knows what it's like to be in his presence for eternity, and he doesn't want you there. So I ask a question. Which generation will you be part of today? Psalms 24, 6 through 8, and I'm coming to a close. See, I put three doors on it, so you know it's a big house. This is the generation of them that seek Him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. Lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Brother Bumgarner, I'm struggling today. Seek Him. Be a part of a generation that seeks Him. Be a part of a generation that says, I'm not going to be a part of that generation that's going the opposite rate. There is a generation today that's going to live for God. There is a generation today that's going to make up their mind to follow Him all the way. There is a generation today that's going to be a seeker of the Lord. But my question is, what generation are you going to be a part of? What generation are you going to be a part of? I don't know about you, but if I wasn't where I needed to be with God, I would do everything I could to get to this altar this morning. If I needed to ask God to forgive me of anything, I would put it at the altar today. I would lay aside bitterness, anger, unbelief, doubt, fear, hurt. Jesus, I love you, 